Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris Fintech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gopkin, and today I'm joined by the founder and CEO of FT Partners, Steve McLaughlin. Great to have you with us again. Great to be here, Elliot. Thanks for having me on again. It's uh, be better to be in Paris uh, this time of year for the uh, show, <laughs> but uh, good to be on. Hopefully next time. So look, uh, before we get cracking, Steve, uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about FT Partners and uh, what's been happening over the past couple of years. So, uh, Steve, last time we spoke, uh, you know, fintech fundraisings, valuations, IPOs and exuberance were at all time highs. Things have changed a bit since then. Uh, as the only fintech focused investment bank, where are we now? Where are we now? Good question. I think, um, look, for for um, for most of us, I think we're on the back end of a pretty tough couple of years. I think the market got, as you said, pretty overheated. But um, I'd say, you know, I think a lot of people were pretty sane during the, the downturn. You know, what I mean by that is for us, we had a pretty much a boom time from 2012 to 2021 and maybe into 2022. I must have said to my team, uh, you know, so many times, like this party's going to end at some point. So, you know, we stockpiled, you know, our resources, you know, we changed our strategy a little bit and, you know, weathered out the two years pretty, pretty well. I think that, um, you know, where the world is, unfortunately, there's been a lot of companies that just didn't make it or having a really tough time. So a lot of VCs and whatnot that invested at pretty high valuations and they're sort of licking their wounds. And But on the back end of it here, two years into a really tough market, I think the market's starting to recover. FinTech companies are getting created from scratch that are a lot better healed than the ones before. So I think, you know, it's just venture capital, that's venture investing, that's banking, that's the industry in the world that we all live in, taking risk and you're gonna see some rough times, but um, I think we're in for another decade of, I would say decadence, but uh, a great decade ahead. And um, I'm sure there'll be some bumps and bruises along the way. And there, won, there were many bumps and bruises in the, 2012 to 22, you know, side of thing as well. So I think we're, we're we've seen we've seen the worst of it. I think we're coming out of it, and the companies that should have survived are surviving. The companies that should get money are getting money. And you know, as it relates to, I think there's probably a lot of VCs, a lot of companies watching this. You know, what I'm seeing is I'm breaking the world down into deciles, not not literally, but sort of somewhat figuratively, and sort of saying that, you know, if you're a top decile company, you can get a top decile type valuation, even a 21 style valuation, right? But if you're probably in the bottom three or four or five deciles of, you know, sort of well performing or not so well performing companies, you're probably having a very, very hard time getting capital and all the VCs to put all the money to the top one or two deciles. And versus many deciles got capital in the past. It's just a matter of valuation. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's um, you know, someone said it's a bit like, uh, you know, Noah's Ark, you know, like, you know, one or two of every kind survive and do really, really well and others get get washed out. But that's that's where we are. Well, um, I mean, you know, you, you talked about the uh, the, the storms that's, uh, that have been raging over the past couple of years and how you kind of made provisions to, to, to weather them. Uh, can you give us a sense of, of, of how you specifically weathered them and how businesses today, because for a fintech focused investment bank to enter a fintech winter, uh, to, for, for want of a better phrase, um, would, would seem to have been, you know, uh, more than just a storm, almost, uh, as you say, like a, a Noah's flood type event. It's in, unless you're the guy building the ark, right? So we're, we're the ones that, you know, so we did see it coming. I'd say the storm was a little worse than maybe everyone thought. But, um, you know, we kept our whole team together. You know, we're still the number one fintech firm in the world for investment banking. We're still the largest vertically focused investment bank in the world. And, you know, we've been hiring. We just hired two great, uh, with one director from Warren Stanley, a VP from somewhere else. And, you know, so we're, we're cranking away. The thing about our business we're very fortunate on is like, you know, projects take about six months. So when you see the market getting a little tricky in segment X, you can just pivot to segment Y or, you know, uh, you know, decile, you know, higher or two. So versus the VCs, which are a tougher game. If you're early stage, you're stuck in these investments for 13 years, or if you're even late stage, you're stuck in for two, three or four years, which now can be six or seven years. So for us, we've kind of, I'm gonna say pivoted, but just like slightly turned the battleship to let's just work for the top two decile companies. So everything that we that we take on is like a, a Revolut or a Cloudwalk or someone like that that are doing a billions of revenues and growing fast, or maybe they're really young, like, like a world coin where 
Sam Altman hired us to help them raise money, no revenue, but we raised a bunch of money at two and a half billion. So, you know, just the, the companies have to be fairly elite because um, that's what the VCs are looking for. And you, you mentioned uh, Revolut because we have, as you say, still seen some big deals with maybe 2021 style valuations happening. Revolut's, uh, you know, in August having a secondary share sale valued at, uh, what, $45 billion, perhaps being the most eye-catching uh, deal that we've seen uh, I- I this year. Um, is this a sign of things to come? And if so, why why is the why is this optimism still there for for these for these bigger companies when so many of the others are, are really struggling? I think it's it's a, kind of like exactly what I said. You know, these are you're talking about top decile companies that are getting you know great valuations, and I think even that valuation was you know sort of so so. Uh, quite frankly, if it was twenty one, that would have been two hundred billion dollars. <laughs> so I think it was a pretty modest valuation relative to everything that I know. Um, yeah, about the company. And so, you know, I don't think it's a harbinger of everyone, but I do think that it, it does say a lot about fintech. And if you look around the world, you know, there's a lot of excitement about open AI and, you know, you know, all sorts of other, you know, Figma, $20 billion and, um, you know, in these bigger companies in the Valley. But, you know, you look at FinTech, you've got Stripe, which is upwards of $100 billion. Revolut, I think it's worth $100 billion today. New banks worth $60, $75 billion. And, you know, you've got Square and a, a bunch of other ones that were not even in existence, you know, you know 10 plus years ago. And they're bigger than than a lot of tech companies in the, the sort of the non-fintech world. And there's some tons and tons and tons of companies below that that are 5, 10, 15, 20 billion, the Klarna's of the world and the N26's and Monzo's and all those kind of com Cloudwalk in Brazil is now worth billions of dollars out of nowhere. So, you know, I think, um, you know, it shows that there's big TAMs, there's big problems, and fintech has been, you know, building big businesses within that. I think the the bigger issue, Elliot, is just that, you know, there was too many people going after the big TAMs with not enough, you know, time and not enough money. You know, I think um, a lot of the businesses I see struggling, if they had more time and more money, they'd get there. But guess what? You know, it's survival of the fittest and you don't need 57 people chasing banking as a service. You don't need 32 um, new digital banks in London. You don't need 57 of them in the US. You need two or three to win the category. And that's what you're seeing. And in almost every space, there's they'd like to back to Noah's Ark again. You're seeing a few companies win per geography, per space, et cetera. And in some, you're going to see some really big companies come out of that. So, um, and I'm, I'm glad to see, look, the market for IPOs is not great, but I don't think the IPO market is a great place to be anyway for these private companies that are growing. So it's a long Okay, but we'll, we'll come back to kind of, you know, the general situation on the markets and the like, because uh, now that we've heard a bit more about FT partners and how you are kind of building the arc that's uh, helped uh, some of those people uh, uh, surviving, we're going to now learn a little bit more about Steve. So, uh, Steve, you know, as we've been discussing, the past few years have been a bit of a roller coaster, no doubt. You've got the scars uh, to, to, to prove it in fintech. What's been the best and worst day for you over, you know, kind of as you've ridden this roller coaster up and ridden it down? Oh, the best day? Uh, well, best day is the birth of my two children. I got to throw out uh, for my uh, three and a half year old boy and 21 month old uh, little daughter. So th those are my best days. Um, but um, no, also just um, I'd say seeing our employees, you know, um, happy and excited about what we're doing. Yeah, we're doing a big offsite in, in Vegas coming up and I'm doing one in London in a week. So just see seeing the team just, you know, power through the 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 the, the weird market that we've been in and, and be excited about the future because it's easy to kind of get a little bummed when, you know, deal X or deal Y is taking a little longer to get done. But, um, you know, we're all pretty excited over here. So worst day, I mean, the worst day is probably, I don't know, just, um, you know, thinking of, I can think of one company that we, that we worked with, you know, that actually went under, I won't say the name of it, but, um, you know, there just was not, it was one of these like 2021 situations where, you know, they had not raised enough money. They were burning a ton of money. They called us at the last minute to get money and there was really nothing you could do to save them and their growth flattened out. And, uh, you know, they had a, you know, really tough outcome. So that, that does happen once in a, you know, 20 something year journey. But, um, you know, so those, those are tough ones. You see people suffering um, from that kind of stuff. But I think, again, it, it goes back to what I said. It's a bit of the survival of this. It's going to happen. All those people are going to do great. And, and um, you know, that's, uh, but the, yeah, those are the tough days when things don't work out. <laughs> 
And you've been doing this, you know, on your own since uh, since you set up FD Partners for more than twenty years. Um, you're still uh, young. You've now got like a a young family, as you were just uh, alluding to. Um, presumably, that affects your priorities in life. So, how how long are you going to stick at stick at it with FT Partners? Um, and, and what other ambitions do you have outside of the business? You know, it's funny because uh, I get asked this question all the time. I I, I think of myself as a 35 year old uh, still. I mean, that's how old I was. I was 32 when I started. I, I don't feel like I've aged. I don't feel like much has changed. The family definitely makes a big difference, you know, having a great wife and kids and and that's a huge priority. So I've pr probably given up my, uh, you know, social time and free time and sleeping time to focus on the kids and the family. So I, that's a probably my, you know, uh, biggest shift in life and a massive, massive priority for me. I, I don't take that lightly. And it, I think it's probably changed my perspective on my clients. You know, I kind of now understand what people are going through that are families and my team members. So, you know, we probably changed our, even the way we give advice, you know, being, being a family man and, and understanding sort of, Hey, people are getting older. People may want liquidity to buy the house, buy the car or whatever. So we're seeing more people do liquidity. So, I mean, I think that, that, you know, that element of you know, who I am is, you know, probably I think changed the advice giving for the for the better, um, in a, in a weird way. But um, you know, for me, it's uh, I think I could go, you know, another fifty years. Um, I'm sure I'll be dead by uh, hundred and something. But but you know, at the end of the day, I love what I'm doing. We have a great team. I'm sure they'll take over the place someday and you know roll me out in a wheelchair in thirty years. But uh, now for now, I'm I'm twenty four seven. Uh, well, I'm sure uh, VCs now will be factoring in, you know, if you've got children, then that's a good thing for uh, for growing a company or growing a business. Uh, maybe it that'll is, become more of a, <laughs> of a priority. Keeps you young, that's for sure. Well, <laughs> that's... the other thing is, I, I keep saying like, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess I could retire early or whatever, but, it, you know, I, I love working. I love what I do. I love this conversation. I got about 20 meetings set up today. I mean, so keeps me young. I think it keeps your brain working. It keeps your yourself motivated. And, and for me, I want my kids to see dad working their whole life. So I've, I've got to work my ass off another 20 years and, you know, teach them the value of a dollar and the value of hard work and, and, um, make sure they don't grow up, you know, privileged or, uh, you know, spoiled. <laughs> well, uh, good luck with that, with all of that, but yeah, you certainly, you certainly don't look your age. So look, uh, Steve, a key part of this interview is to get your take on the future of finance, but first. We are going to take a very quick break, after which we are going to continue our conversation with FT Partners founder and CEO, Steve McLaughlin. Welcome back. And don't forget, if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. Okay, Steve, so now let's talk about the future of finance. So, uh, Steve, you know, we've got interest rates declining. Uh, financial markets have been on a bit of a tear in 2024, especially in terms of tech and anything that smells of uh, generative artificial intelligence. How's the situation when it comes to fintech startups? We talked about Noah's Ark before, but has the rising tide lifted all boats or only some of them? Well, I think the rising tide is definitely not lifting all boats and, and, um, you know, and that's okay. I think, um, you know, a lot of folks are, you know, it's interesting. It's like, I'm seeing a lot of CEOs say, look, 
this company X has been great. I want to sell it. I want to move on. It's not going to moon like I thought it would or whatever. And VCs are getting tired. They want out. So I think you're going to see a lot of exits. You're going to see a lot of founders going out and starting new companies, right? Quite frankly. And there's a lot of VCs I know that are really focused on second time entrepreneurs. So you're, you're seeing a lot of fatigue, but you're also seeing a lot of excitement about the next wave. And that's, that's really what we're seeing that this next wave of companies, the ones that were started five years ago, or even one or two years ago is are the ones that are, to me, the most exciting in the world. And I think it'd be way bigger than the ones that I was talking about earlier that are $100 billion companies. Because um, I think my big drum I'm beating these days is just that the, these problems that people got so excited about fixing in fintech are massive, right? And and um, the, the TAMs are, have never shrunk, right? It's it's And the banks have not gotten any better. They've gotten worse at, at everything. And when I say banks, it's banks, insurance companies. They've, they've innovated very, very little. Um, and so what what's changing, though, is people now have a laundry list of what didn't work in, you know, the first, you know, last 10 years. So if your business didn't go, you know, gangbusters, well, there's probably lots of really good reasons. Well, the good news is those are all kind of knowable things. You know, going direct to consumer, you know, is tougher than going B2B to C, you know, going and building a, a brand in consumer financial services, very hard and very expensive. So just lessons like that, um, you know, make it very hard, you know, leverage doing, trying to do everything yourself. Sometimes that's great, you know, where you build literally every single possible thing, but, you know, SpaceX wouldn't be SpaceX if they had to build every single component of of the uh, missile themselves and so or the the rocket themselves. So you're seeing more and more businesses these days, you're, you know, pick one or two things they're going to do right and then leverage an ecosystem that already exists, you know, to, 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 to skyrocket their business. So I think, um, you know, I use this analogy about, you know, and I think it's a good one, web van, for those of you who can remember, but back in the <laughs> 1999, 2000 era before the dot com market you know, disintegrated, you know, people said, you know, hey, it's a great idea to deliver groceries straight to your house or you can order online, deliver straight to your house. But the, the, the solution at the time was let's build gigantic warehouses in every city with refrigeration. Let's order food there, stock it up, have higher full time employees, get super expensive trucks with a refrigerated, heated bring the stuff to your front door, deliver it in. It's all perfectly fresh and perfect. And it turns out, guess what? After, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, that business plundered into nothing. Um, but now you've got businesses where, you know, you're using Kroger and, you know, um, all sorts of other existing food stores. You're using someone else's scooter, someone else's employee, you know, someone else's insurance, and you're getting the same food to the door and places like Instacart can make, you know, massive money. So, you know, these models that leverage existing technologies, existing infrastructure, existing inventory, you know, are the models of the future. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's other ways of doing it, but um, I think, I think fintech is looking at the world the same way, reinventing business models who have the same problem with more innovative solutions. And of course, in terms of innovation, I mean, you talked about the excitement about the next wave, but of course, much of the excitement over the past, you know, 12, 18 months has been the impact of artificial intelligence, or at least its potential impact. How do you see this impacting kind of your area in terms of, you know, VC investing or um, IPOs or, you know, beyond the valuations of fintechs because of their association with artificial intelligence is what I mean. How, how do you feel AI is going to affect those companies and certainly the way that, you know, investors, and investment banks and the like deal with, um, you know, financial, the financial industry? I mean, I think there's, there's probably two elements. There's, there's one where there's a, you know, a series of companies that are very AI first, right? And, We've been in the AI world for a long, long time. If you Google my name and AI and MIT, you'll see I was speaking on a panel. I don't feels like eight years ago on this, you know. And so, you know, and one of our clients, Feedzai, in 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 Portugal, they're a fraud solutions platform, F E E D Z A I, founded ten years ago. Um, or Alpha Sense, right? You founded, you know, probably ten years ago. These are companies that have been AI first since day one, and. And, um, you know, this new world of generative AI, you know, again, you're seeing two categories, companies that are focused fully on AI, like the companies I'm mentioning, and companies that are using AI, right, to dramatically increase their business. Companies like Revolut, and I keep mentioning Cloudwalk because I spent time with them the other day. Um, but, you know, they're they're basically using AI to eliminate humans from big parts of their business. So Cloudwalk, there are no, you know, sort of customer service people, it's all AI driven, right? 
Um, of course, if you have an emergency or a crisis or something that a person will pick up the phone, you know, on on marketing and sales, the whole marketing and sales engine is driven by, you know, generative AI and AI. So same thing with Revolut. They don't make individual decisions on how they're going to market their dollars in 67 countries and 57 platforms per country. You know, it's all driven by, you know, thoughtfully created generative AI or AI and generative AI in terms of the ads. So, you know, uh, it's it's making a massive difference in the success of companies. If you're not using it, it's going to cost you too much to generate code. It's going to cost you too much to advertise, too much to service customers, too much to onboard customers, and you're pretty much going to lose. So unless you're, you know, very, very AI first in every single aspect of your business, I think you're going to be at a massive disadvantage. And and that particularly applies to fintech is you're talking about a world where there are, you know, more or less no physical products in fintech. It's all technology. It's all code. It's all risk. It's all analytics. It's all underwriting. Um, it's all customer service. And um, that's just the way the world works. So, you know, AI is maybe less critical to creating iPhones, but more to, you know, the financial services world. Right. Uh, and Steve, you know, changing tax slightly, you're, you're in the US, uh, but you work with and have worked with, you know, some of the biggest fintechs in Europe, Revolut, you know, we've mentioned a few times among others. Uh, how do the two, you know, jurisdictions compare in terms of fostering fintechs and which part of the world, if it's not Europe or the US, um, do you see as uh, likely to be the, 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 the kind of uh, epicenter or, or, or where the next big thing in fintech is going to come from? I mean, look, it's interesting, right? You know, some of the largest, most successful fintech companies are not in the U.S. I mean, Revolut, I think is, you know, like I said, I think it's every bit worth $100 billion, even though the round was at 45, you know, and it's growing at 80% a year. So, and they're they're in, they're out of London, but they're a global company, right? You look at uh, New Bank of Brazil, I mentioned earlier, you know, 60 billion, you know, there isn't a digital bank in the U.S., you know, worth 20 billion, right? And so, um, you know, I think it's interesting to see that the U.S. got, you know, probably the biggest economy, the most homogenous, you know, user base and all their infrastructure there and ready. And also we we all think we've got fairly broken, you know, banking and insurance, you know, kind of traditional platforms. So, you know, it's it's interesting to see how Europe and places like Brazil have outpaced the U.S. and creating real, you know, meaningful companies. And, you know, of course, you've got the Chimes and the Varos and lots of other great companies in the U.S. that upgrade. And these are companies that can be massive. But but they're they're not as big as the other ones. So I think it's interesting. It's not that Europe wins and you got Stripe in the US and Square in the US. So I think it's sort of like both companies or both countries or both continents, I should say, um, and all continents can, can create great winners. Um, you know, in Indonesia, there's there's a ton of great multi-billion dollar um, companies and the rest of Southeast Asia. So I think we're, that's one thing about us, we're operating on six continents, doing deals in Africa, India, you know, Middle East, Asia, you name it. And there's multi-billionaire companies everywhere. So we just go where the good companies are. Okay. Worth noting, of course, that Stripe's founders are Irish. So um, that you counts go. as European, I guess, uh, depending on where you're coming sure. from. Um, but uh, look, uh, Steve, it's time now for our round of rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. got 90 seconds on the clock we'll try and get through as many as we can one word answers is all i'm after and i'm going to start the clock now and we'll get through as many as we can so steve what fintech segment in your view has the biggest potential over the next five years ai what is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life that you'd like to see resolved none you can part. <laughs> our <laughs> bank boss our bank boss is ready for the ai revolution uh, I don't think so. Are customers ready? I don't think so. Have regulators on both sides of the pond, the EU and US, kept pace with all the new possibilities and behaviors we're seeing in the financial industry? I don't think so. Have you personally ever invested in crypto? No. Are physical points of sales part of the future of finance? Yes. Are bank branches part of the future of finance? Sure, why not? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the most likely, 1 the least, uh, how probable is it that over the next 10 years, one of the neobanks will be as profitable as a top-tier legacy bank? 100%. That central bank, digital, central bank digital currencies will become a mainstream reality in the US or the EU? Central bank digital currencies? Um, um, I Out would of 10? say 7. It's that you'll be, able, you'll be able to open a crypto account at a top-tier bank? Not in the next five years. That SWIFT will still be the main tool for transferring money around the world? Probably not. Out of 10, out of 10, Steve. 
out of ten, <laughs> out of the instructions, uh, five. Okay, and finally, because my alarm just gone off, uh, that a, a new card or non-card based rival would emerge to challenge Visa or Mastercard. Seven. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right, Steve. Well, look, uh, that's the end of our uh, very successful rapid uh, fire uh, round of questions. Uh, but I'm afraid it's also <laughs> all we've got time for for our conversation. So I really just want to thank you again, FT Partners founder and CEO, Steve McLaughlin, for joining me today. Thanks so much. Elliot, thank you, buddy. And for everyone watching, we will be back again next time with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We do hope you'll be able to join us again then. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the Paris Fintech Forum YouTube channel and to follow us on X at Paris Fin Forum. That's all for now. See you next time. Bye-bye.